Well, of all the issues our country is grappling with, immigration is at the top of the list for many. But what about our region? When you think immigration, do you think St. Louis? Are we missing out on the upside to immigration? Or is it a bigger part of our story than we realize? Tonight, what role did immigration play in our past? What role should it play in our future? Stay tuned. And on Stay Tuned, you drive the discussion. We bring local experts, journalists, and civic leaders together to have tough conversations for a stronger St. Louis. Tweet us your insights on tonight's topic, and you've got a seat at the table. With a few national experts and a panel of community members, this is the show bringing more light and less heat to the issues that matter. So stay tuned. Okay, starting this off uh, tonight to kind of set the table, we're joined by journalist reporter Doug Moore of St. Louis Post Dispatch. Hello, Casey. How are you doing? Welcome, doing well. Welcome, Thank you. welcome back. Good to have you here. Let me, can I read you something from the Missouri Historical Society? Okay. 1860, fully half of the 160,000 residents in St. Louis were foreign born. Uh, Germans, Irish, uh, sprinkling of English, French, Swiss, others. Um, what's our what's our what's our uh, status when it comes to immigrants and foreign born in St. Louis now? Well, Missouri overall ranks is still w the lowest. It was in the bottom five of uh, states with the least amount of foreign born residents. So, we're still a really sort of homogenous uh, state and. Um, but it, when we talk about the bigger picture of immigration and how it, you know, we sometimes people don't think of St. Louis and Missouri as having an immigration issue, but there are 65,000 undocumented folks that are living in the state of Missouri, and uh, so they are affected, and they have relatives here that and and friends, and so there's actually, you know, that that ends up being 100,000, 200,000 people that are affected by the reform efforts and uh, the recent action with Obama. I was just going to ask you about that. Yeah. So that's certainly in the top of the news right now. The, his executive order was halted uh, temporarily it at was, least yeah. by a federal judge. What, does, that, does any of that, we, when we hear the national reports, I don't know that they've ever reported uh, with the arch in the background on that story. What, what, well, does, it have, does it have an impact on our area? I guess People. it doesn't have as big of an impact just in numbers because you think of probably Texas and California and Arizona and places like that where the immigration population is much higher. But yes, it does, because like I said, there are folks living here that would love to have that, so, that security and, and some of those um, guidelines that were going to be put out and were going to be rolled out um, yesterday, uh, but now have been put on hold indefinitely while um, we figure out kind of how the, the legal uh, hurdles are going to go now. And you know, where, will this be appealed? And uh, you know, it, it's, it's unfortunately, it's a political issue, right? Like, like so many things are. So, but pe people's futures are sort of uncertain while the, the president wrestles with Congress on this issue. Is, it, is immigration as political uh, in Missouri or maybe St. Louis, or, or maybe to back up for a second, is the immigration story different in Missouri versus St. Louis, in Illinois versus St. Louis? St. Louis have its own story there. Um, unique story, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, a, it's maybe a smaller story here, but it certainly is. And we're, we'll hear from people on the panel who can talk a little bit more specifically about those things. But yeah, I mean, it is an issue. And when you go into the community and talk to people, you do find out that there, there's a lot of people out there living, um, you know, wondering what's going to happen. You know, I'm, I'm living here. I came in as a child. I'm not a, a legal citizen. You know, what, is, what does that mean for me? And it's surprising the numbers that are out there, but sometimes these Folks are often considered invisible, or they're living very, you know, under the radar on purpose because they don't want a lot of attention called to themselves. Is the is the issue overall? Is it nearly as contentious as it is on the border? States? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Like you said, you don't see the reporting with the the arch in the background. You you see a lot of these debates much more in uh, California and Arizona and Florida, places like that. What, what are the topics that people are talking about in St. Louis? Well, as you said, we'll hear from more later tonight, but help us uh, educate us a little bit. There's a push in St. Louis uh, that's very uh, 
aggressively uh, courting immigrants. A absolutely. I mean, it, you know, there's a, a large percentage. If you look at the history of immigrants, um, the majority of small businesses are started by immigrants. They're the driving force in, in, our, in our labor, you know, a lot of the menial labor, the jobs that, you know, if you look um, in rural communities especially, people that are working on the farms, people that are working in agriculture, people that are working in landscaping, people that are working in food service. Um, so it, it affects a lot of people. And the, the, the drivers of the economy are the immigrants. And so there are people like the St. Louis Mosaic Project who have set goals to recruit more immigrants because a lot of immigrants are coming here for professional jobs as well. They're professors, they're doctors, and they are really contributing a, a huge amount to, to what's going on here. But how do you keep them here? If it doesn't feel like it's a welcome environment or there's not this network in place to say, we want you here, uh, we value you here, then they will go places that they think they do have, uh, where maybe there are more people that, or more programs that they think are better suited for them. Or, we, or even just more people who speak their language, perhaps. Absolutely, yeah. It is a culture thing. You'll see people like refugees who come here, they'll end up grouping together because they, they, you want to live in the same sort of culture where, where uh, you know, it's, 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 it's more familiar and welcoming. Do we have that network that you're talking about? Do we have, I know the, the uh, International Institute has a brand new building in St. Louis. We, We've seen yeah, that in the news. Yeah, yeah, we do. I mean, and those, those efforts are growing. And you, you're going you're to hear more and more about these efforts as they go forward because they're building and building. Because I think, you know, St. Louis has been doing this, but maybe not as aggressively as they should have. And I think now that we do have the International Institute, which has, you know, it expanded its headquarters and which will allow it uh, for more programming and to reach more people and do a lot more community outreach, bring the community into and, and educate them on the, the immigrants, the culture, the differences that we actually do have here. That's a great segue, Doug. Actually, because we we didn't <laughs> plan it, but, but we, we, we should take credit and say we did. Uh, but let's let's take a look. Thank you for starting this off. Of course. Let's take a look at the International Institute and what is going on there. We're at the International Institute of St. Louis in our new campus on 3401 Arsenal Street. We offer English and citizenship programming, English classes ranging from beginners through intermediate and we have citizenship preparation to help our students prepare for the citizenship test so that they can naturalize. Many of the people who we serve are refugees who are part of our refugee resettlement program and refugees come to St. Louis because of the International Institute. They are connected to us through a federal program and then we provide their resettlement services here in town. Other students of ours may be connected through employers who suggested they need um, some English help or through word of mouth through the ethnic communities. People often find out about our English classes because um, we have the biggest ESOL program in the city. Many newcomers don't have all of the skills that can be applied to work here in St. Louis right away. And so in order to get them into work as soon as possible, they go through some of our training programs. And those can be in um, hotel housekeeping or industrial sewing are some of the ones that require the littlest amount of English in order to be successful, some hands-on work. But we do teach English as a part of those classes. And we also have a certified nurse assistant training program for those individuals who have a higher level of English and they have a desire to work in the healthcare industry. 91% of the people who go through our training programs get jobs after successfully completing those programs. And we're also adding some programs for professional immigrants who want to work um, in engineering or another um, sort of high-skilled area to help them navigate through the uh, the process of getting a job, which is resume writing, interviewing, um, networking, things that you need to do in America in order to get a job, um, the job that you want. And um, so we're offering this new program called Career Advancement for International Professionals, and that will allow individuals who come here with engineering degrees, law degrees, um, other high degrees that have the desire to work in those fields but have been limited by their skills and culturally navigating the American workplace culture. At our previous location, we were very constrained by space and parking, and also the location itself was not incredibly accessible by highways and from downtown St. Louis. And so we had been thinking about where can we go to uh, meet those needs of the wider St. Louis community, the non-refugee immigrant community, and um, other people who we engage with throughout the year. 
Um, so we moved to this location, which is the former St. Elizabeth Academy High School, in order to um, expand our programs as they existed at South Grand, and also to eventually add new programming, things that we had had in our vision for the agency, but didn't have the space to do at our previous location. Every year in August, we produce the Festival of Nations in Tower Grove Park, and that is an annual celebration for us to bring together the longest time and the newest St. Louisans um, to celebrate their many cultural differences and similarities and eat food, of course. That's the main reason people come um, to celebrate with us. And last year, um, more than 60,000 people came out for the event. The participants enjoy performing because they it gives them the opportunity to preserve their culture from year to year. If they know that their troupe is expected to perform at the festival, then they will train the next generation on those traditions, whether it's a dance or a musical tradition. The Festival of Nations gives them the opportunity to pass that on from year to year, even though language may be lost, other cultural aspects may be lost, but that arts tradition can continue. And that's a big part of our mission with the festival is cultural preservation. If you haven't been to the festival in Tower Grove, you've got to go. If, like they said, if, if for nothing else, the food, but it's a great experience. It really is. Okay, so joining us at the first table, the president and CEO of the International Institute of St. Louis, Anna Crossland, I'll say Jorge Rio Pedre, executive director of Casa de Salud, and Betsy Cohen, executive director of the St. Louis Mosaic Project. Okay, so St. Louis, I believe, is in the top 20-ish metro population-wise. I have here 43rd in the number of foreign-born citizens. Uh, why do we struggle to attract and retain immigrants, Betsy? Well, historically, and, and Anna can talk a bit about that too, we just have not, in the recent years, been a mecca for international people to come here. Um, some of it has been organic with slow population growth overall, and some of it has been a lack of attraction strategies that will bring, you know, bring people here who are either professionals or high skilled or lesser skilled to really give them an opportunity to make their career here. Mm -hmm. You know, we heard a few minutes ago that uh, in 1860, the city was 50% immigrants. Uh, by 1900, it had dropped to 19% immigrants. And so there was a huge drop just in that period. And uh, today, it's 4.3% uh, immigrants. Yeah. And so it has been on a steady decline uh, since that peak. It, it peaked in terms of being the fourth largest city in the United States in 1900. Uh, it peaked in terms of population that was immigrant in 1860. Where did it, what, what was the decline? In some ways, the decline is related to other kinds of issues here in St. Louis, where we saw that resulted in decline too, mainly the change in transportation, in, the, in inland transportation from steamboats that used to come up uh, from, um, from New Orleans then to St. Louis and Dock to the change and the transcontinental railroad system, which uh, finally was joined in 1869 with Chicago as the hub. And so at that point then, the major number of newcomers that came into the inland part of the United States and West actually came by train through Chicago and bypassed St. Louis. So the, the same reason anyone else, uh, the reason our growth any other, for any other reason was not yeah. what it was yeah. at one time. Right. Um, okay, so fast forward a little bit, 1980s. Uh, this is from Phil Dine, who formerly worked for the uh, Post-Dispatch, doing a lot of what Doug Moore does. Uh, it, this is something he wrote in the 1980s, and then also talking about the 90s, from uh, whether it be uh, refugees from uh, fleeing war or from Mexico, Central America. St. Louis was attractive because immigration was not an issue that aroused passion, acrimony, or even much discussion. So we weren't, we're not attracting, but we're not turning them away either. Is that still the case? Is it still viewed that way? St. Louis when it comes to immigration? You know, I think it's been stable, but we are increasing. And it's interesting because we are declining in our native-born population, but we are actually increasing in our foreign-born population, just not fast enough to overcome the numbers that we're losing of our native-born. So it's been quiet growth. And I think to that point, it's happened in a quiet way. We were growing at about 2.3% of our foreign-born, but places like Baltimore are growing 5% a year in their foreign-born, and that's helping grow the region. So ours is quietly ramping up, but the question is, can we make it bigger? 
but I think it's quiet, to your point. It isn't something that's terrifically visible, and partly because our foreign-born population is very dispersed in the region. People live all over. The maps show that our foreign-born population is all over based on where they work, where they want to live, the school districts, the green space, their homes. They have a lot of opportunities. So in some ways, you don't have that concentration that arouses you know, more passion either in favor of it or against it. People will love, I think, uh, South Grand or Cherokee Street has the flavor, but it's not, that's not, not the concentration of where people live is what you're saying. No, it's very interesting because the statistics show that, again, we have 4.3% as a region. The highest percent neighborhood is Olivet at close to 20%, and then Maryland Heights at about 14 to 15, followed by Chesterfield. Um, in terms of percent foreign born because we have so many people, in this case, many of them that are high skilled and some that are lesser skilled that live all over. Yeah, and last year, CASA served uh, uh, people from 28 different counties in Illinois and Missouri, just to make to Betsy's point about how dispersed people are uh, who, live, who live in our region. Why is it important? I, I think uh, if I had to guess, all three of you would say it's important that this number grow faster. Why? Uh, I think that, uh, the more that we have a strong foreign-born population uh, here in, in St. Louis and the region in general, uh, the better we are going to do economically, uh, the better that we are going to do uh, just in terms of diversity, a place that people want to live in. You look at, and I know and that Anna has lots of stories about this, you look at millennials and you see that millennials want to live in a diverse world the way that they are diverse. And if we're not able to grow the population that looks like the millennials who are our new job creators and our new job doers, uh, then they are going to take one of their many other options outside of St. Louis, and that can only be to our detriment. Yeah. What's so interesting about the immigrants, Jack Strauss did a study, former professor at St. Louis University, did a study in 2012 um, about uh, the economic impact of immigration in St. Louis, and what he found were, were that immigrants were 60% more likely to be entrepreneurs, to start businesses here than native-born um, um, St. Louisans. That's really important when small business is the backbone of economic growth in this country. The other issue that's really important is population growth, that one of the issues that St. Louis has suffered from so long uh, with this declining population is that we don't have enough people to be able to buy the goods and services that people want to be able to sell in the community. So the truth of the matter is new population um, in general is important to our area. But then when you look at the statistics, what you find is the new growth in this country in terms of population is immigrant. So you have to put the two and two to go together and say, if you want more population, then it inevitably has to be immigrant at this point. And Betsy has some really interesting numbers in terms of, of growth, population growth. I think that's why when the steering committee of the St. Louis Mosaic Project set this goal that by 2020, our goal is that we should be the fastest growing me major metropolitan area for immigration, the view was we need neighborhood vitality, we need businesses started, we need our schools to stay open and not face declining population. And that's gonna come when people see that it's in their economic interest to come to a neighborhood to start a business. And it could be a high-tech business, a new app, or it could be a neighborhood business. Actually, we just had a winner of an immigrant entrepreneurship contest uh, this week, and it's the ZB Market, which is down on South Grand, and it's a business that was started by a gentleman here who's actually from Peru, and he started a business. And so these businesses that become started then they provide a livelihood, the family is here, the schools stay open, we also have housing. And so these are all the contributors to regional economic prosperity. And then with that, you get what Jorge said, which is a community that is more inclusive, multicultural, where everybody wants to live. Because it's more interesting and it's the where people who are thinking about what's gonna be a more vibrant reality are gonna to wanna to be. And I'm curious, I'm sure it has to do a lot with what, uh, what culture, where, where they're coming from, uh, but do immigrants look at some of our, the bones of our city and, and find it attractive where some of our locals may be looking for a bigger yard and a bigger house? There's, a, there's a something about our fabric that they find attractive. And, uh, yeah, and we hear that up. often, you know, that we find that, that both the neighborhoods are very appealing, the green space is appealing, 
the amenities we have as a region, um, things like the history of soccer in St. Louis. We have a lot of attention towards soccer because that's important to many immigrants. We have a lot of things going that are very appealing because the cost of living contributes to that. It's easy to start a business and it's not hard to raise a family. So 2020 we used to sound like it was a long way away. But <laughs> it's it, not. But it's so unbelievably it's not. not. So how are we doing? So, well, we are growing, but again, Mosaic Project has only been in existence not quite two years in terms of um, really my being a leader of an initiative that we actually have programs and ambassador programs and professional connector programs that really help people begin to build bridges for their jobs. So we're in the beginning stages of launching programs that will help make that more possible. Well, and to follow up on that, the International Institute, and if, if Mosaic Project is really about attracting immigrants here, then the International Institute is about helping to retain them. And so we're about providing the services that are necessary to be able to help the additional individuals that are going to be coming. And so we've just moved in the last 30 days also to ramp up our services. And so what we're expecting to see now over the next few years is this growth in, um, in the numbers of individuals that come and expansion in services then to be able to address their needs, um, both uh, the Hispanic population with Casa de Salud in their services and, and collaboration with the International Institute and other organizations in the community. You know, we're really going to be looking at how can we help to retain those immigrants that are already here in the community and those that we are, we're uh, going to be attracting. Doug mentioned it a little bit, but how much of the uh academic world is, is a part of our immigration story and as, as we're going forward. It's a big part of the story. Um, one of the things that the study by Professor Jack Strauss had identified was that we have up to 9,000 international students here and they are very interested in staying if we can help them make the connection between their skill sets, the visa opportunities that are, are not simple but they're doable to manage and then the university with their international student guidance, the career service office and ultimately with those companies that are hiring. And part of my time in this coming year is going to be spent increasingly with companies in the community to explain to them why would they be interested in hiring international students and then how. And I have a team of our immigration lawyers who are offering assistance to help do some of that education with me. How and why can you hire some of the international talent? We actually have a gap in the region of STEM jobs that are going unfilled. Um, one of the times I was here with Jim McKelvey and partly why he created you know, Launch Code was these reasons um, for talent. And we have a lot of international talent that's in these graduate programs and in the STEM fields, but we have to make that connection so that the employers and the companies can find the talent and also understand a mechanism for how to hire the great talent that we already have. We talk about attracting and then retaining. Is, are, Jorge, are there, are there holes in our net when it comes to support, when it comes to our network that we're talking about? Of, services or, or just help in any way that might sure, be Sure, there are holes. I mean, one of them, and I think the reason that, uh, that uh, Bob Fox is the chairman of, Saint Louis, uh, of uh, Casa de Salud and his role as a trustee of St. Louis University uh, started Casa de Salud is because healthcare is uh, a gap, especially after a predecessor clinic failed. Uh, if you can't uh, have adequate uh, basic healthcare, uh, then you're not going to be able to pursue an education or get a job or start a business. Uh, so that uh, that's continues to be a major challenge uh, that we're going to be facing in the for, for foreseeable future. But I think the pieces are in place. Uh, you know, CASA and other safety net organizations, uh, as Anna just said, you have the attraction piece, you have the retention piece, uh, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the Asian Chamber of Commerce. You really have this growing momentum, I would argue, in St. Louis that uh, that is feeding upon what is going on and we're reaching, reaching the proverbial trip, tipping point where I think you are going to see some dramatic progress in the next few years. Just real quickly, I'm, you know, unfortunately, uh, tragically, there are refugee spots around the country. Are we reaching out? Is there any effort? I'm just curious to say, uh, come to St. Louis uh, if, if the UN got involved again like they did yeah. in previously. Well, um, we actually sponsor uh, refugees to St. Louis every year. It's one of, the, um, uh, one of the things that we do through the International Institute. We're the state's largest refugee resettlement organization in addition to our other services. That doesn't mean that we sponsor a lot, though, because there are only 70,000 refugees who are admitted to the United States annually. And so we sponsor about five to 600 of those into St. Louis every year. But what happens then is once a group will arrive in St. Louis, then secondary migration can occur. This is what happened with the Bosnian population, for instance. Over a period of um, 10 years, uh, we sponsored about 7,000 Bosnians to St. Louis, but the community today, including American-born children, is as much as 50,000 people. The reason that happened was because once 
the bosnians got to st louis they discovered affordable housing you know good entry level jobs a welcoming community and they told cousin odd not in san francisco and you know and 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 everybody to come to st louis instead and they came the newspaper moved from new york City. right right and so this was so secondary migration can be an attraction um, in and of itself thank you all very much mm -hmm. i appreciate your perspective stick around if you would we want to get a perspective from the other side of the state as well there are a couple of uh, documentary, uh, documentarians working on this very issue. Uh, here's a couple of things they've uh, found that you might find surprising. Well, we are working on a project called Your Fellow Americans. It's sponsored by Kansas City Public Television here in KC. And what it is is an online documentary series taking a look at issues of race, immigration, and the American dream. So what we're doing is we're, we're going and talking to as many different folks from as many different backgrounds as possible. Um, and, and trying to do that in an intergenerational way. So, so generally we'll be talking to uh, grandparents, parents and children, so three generations, uh, trying to see um, how things are changing. Are they getting better or worse with regards to race, immigration and the American dream? P people still feel that the American dream is a reality, but I think it really depends on where they're situated as to how easily attainable it is, because you know, in speaking with the Cadillo family and speaking, I'd say, with the um, Malik family, the Indian American family that we just interviewed, if you identify the American dream as the ability to better your situation and provide a, you know, a better chance at opportunities for your children, you know, give them a level up from where you found yourself when you were growing up, they'd say that that is very much, that it is very alive and well. There is kind of that tension between the, the desire for the culture and the desire to participate in all the opportunities available to and, and I, and America. I th and I think that's the 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 clash that we, I mean, maybe more than the specific perspective of hey, like I've chosen to kind of put my my past heritage behind. What we see more commonly is, well, I kind of feel like I have to put some of my past mm -hmm. heritage behind me, or else myself and my children won't have the full opportunities that are available to other Americans. Um, that's the, the, the conflict we've seen. I think if, if it, uh, what was interesting then about the, the Latino American family that we had interviewed is it was actually the, the second generation immigrants even who, who are now in their 90s. 90s, 90s, in their 90s, they didn't teach their children Spanish. So it's, what it's interesting is for in this specific case anyway, it was even that older generation that wasn't so much passing down their, their culture because they first, they were hyper aware of uh, the opportunities that um, might be unavailable to their children. A lot of your interactions are impacted by how you look. And it, with that Latino family, they often have experiences where people assume and expect mm -hmm. uh, that they can speak Spanish or they automatically look at them and assume that they you know are immigrants themselves or potentially even undocumented immigrants and so the, these issues of, of immigration tie into racism because it becomes prejudices and assumptions that can negatively impact the lives of of large portions of our population one thing that we like to say or that we try to remember to say is that we're not experts uh, we're, we're curious individuals and we're filmmakers we we think these are important conversations to be discussing and so we're asking the questions well we were talking about you and you're here so we should talk to you these are our millennials i feel like these are our young people to, and, and also uh with a personal experience with immigration and, and so let me do introductions first Ina Salimovic, a Washington University student, Vin Co, program manager, St. Louis Mosaic Project, yes. we just heard from Betsy, mm -hmm. and Karina Arango, a Fontbonne bon University student. So let me ask you guys, you've heard us talk about it. How do you talk about it? How, how, what's immigration in St. Louis mean to you? What does it mean to you? Well, I mean, it really builds upon the diverse population that we already have here. I mean, uh, Betsy touched upon it a bit in, in, in her uh, piece um, where she talked about upon soccer and just mm -hmm. seeing the amount of diversity. Yeah, I saw your head um, shaking in the background. When she <laughs> yeah. said soccer, you got excited. Yeah, I mean, so I was one of the founding members of St. Louis Pickup Soccer on Facebook, and it really shows and hi highlights the breadth of diversity that we have in the region that, you know, growing up in St. Louis, I didn't realize we had. 
Um, we have, you know, um, not just ethnically uh, diverse, also socioeconomically, where we have, you know, local executives playing with refugees, immigrants, students, really participating in the game of sport and kind of seeing that all happen. You uh, mentioned, I, I should back up maybe, if you don't mind, uh, yeah. some personal questions for a second. I mean, you said growing up in St. Louis. Give me, tell me your story. Your, your, your parents, you were born here? Yes. Your parents came from? Um, they immigrated here from Hong Kong. Um, my parents uh, worked in uh, my grandparents' through restaurants. My dad worked as, uh, as there and then went back to school in Rolla and would drive back even with his young family uh, to work on weekends in their restaurants. And then I'm originally from St. Louis. I grew up in the Olivet area. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, I went away for college in, in California and decided to move back. And I mean, being part of the Mosaic Project really kind of is in the culmination of all the things Full that circle. I'm interested in. So, yeah. Any, any your, your story? Uh, share with us if you would. I came here in 1998 after Turkey, living in Turkey for six years. And luckily, I have no memory of that. My earliest memory is all about me and teenage angst, <laughs> <laughs> like any other child. But, uh, and I've been here for the most part. Originally, you, your family moved to Turkey from, was it, were you? Bosnia. In, in Bosnia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and same question to you, your personal uh, So I'm a first generation born here. Uh, my mother in 1989 uh, made that sacrifice of coming to this country by floating on a tire across the Rio Grande. Um, and I'm thankful for her and thankful for my family. Um, but we've been here for nearly two decades. I'm 22 years old. I was born and raised in St. Louis. Um, lover of St. Louis, lover of soccer. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, when we speak of immigration, um, the first thing that comes to mind is we are a nation of immigrants. Yeah. We should never, ever forget that. Um, whether your, your family has been here for six generations, six months, six years, or no matter how you came here, but you're here and we want to include you. We want to be inclusive and we want to make St. Louis an attractive, but also retain the immigrants that have already been here for generations because they're immigrant families that still don't feel like the city or the state wants them or welcomes them. Do you feel that way? Um, I think there are some gaps that as a state um, we need to fill and as a city we need to fill. Um, nonetheless, the love is there and the support is there, but I think there's some need that we need to talk about and um, bring more dialogue to. There's a lot of perspectives you know, when we think of immigration. So. Do you, yeah. do, I was gonna say, do you wish you were, uh, do you, do you wish you were in Chicago, uh, or, or, or is that the same as any millennial might wish they have a, a longing for a bigger city, <laughs> or, or, or is, there a, is there something that uh, you feel like uh, you might find culturally in, in somewhere mm -hmm. besides St. Louis, or do you, find it, do you find it right here? I don't know about this millennial uh, title, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. But I, I think some really great things are beginning to happen in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I chose to move back was um, I was kind of seeing what was happening from afar and I really wanted to have an impact. I knew I wanted to get into community service. And um, that's really what drove me to come back home to where a place that I care about and where I can have the most impact. And I mean, with the Mosaic Project, it, part of that is, you know, there's economic growth and helping small businesses grow and providing services and programs through the International Institute. But I mean, it's kind of facilitating those conversations, really bringing people together. Yeah, and to go off on what Anna and Betsy were talking about, this city is still affordable. And yeah. as fresh out of school students, there's still <laughs> students, grad students. Yeah. We're not going to be stable in any other city. And St. Louis is still managing mm -hmm. to give us that stability yeah. and to stay. Yeah, and St. Louis needs us. We need yeah. each other. We need to be yeah. here to, to later become a Chicago, a New York. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we think of Chicago, it has so many immigrants, you know, and all these resources and communities. This is why we decided to stay here. Yeah. This is why I've been decided to come back all the way from California to come <laughs> back to St. Louis because we need to be here because we know we need to build that community, yeah. that inclusive yeah. community that includes immigrants. Yeah. You can have a personal role in expanding mm -hmm. projects like the exactly. St. Louis Mosaic Project or International Institute, and that's mm -hmm. empowering somehow. It's very yeah. empowering. You mentioned uh, you, you, you're glad you don't have memories uh, pre-St. Louis. Uh, yeah. How much of your uh, cultural history are you able to hang on to and, and how important is that? Does, that? does that matter? Well, I mean, there's definitely a tricky... Is that a fight? Is there a little there, friction a, there with mom and dad? There's for sure. Yes. I mean, um, growing up uh, in any situation, any sort of difference, you're quickly aware of the differences um, uh, that you bring to the community. But I mean... What do you mean? 
Um, I mean, just in looking different, mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, growing up, maybe your parents said something in a different way than, <laughs> than you know, what's normal speak. <laughs> but I mean, it, you went to school with some different phraseology, <laughs> right? Yeah, okay. pretty much. And I can relate to that. I me. mean, it, those sorts of things kind of shape the way you grow mm -hmm. up, and I think it's 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 easy to kind of go one way or another, and finding that balance and really navigating that personal growth is important uh, with anybody. I mean, especially when, you know, you can't, you know, point out, out exactly your your parents grew up having this experience at this location. You're really on the forefront um, of developing those memories and uh, things. So. Yeah, I, I don't have as much of a problem with that because I, tip, I don't <laughs> look at me. I look pretty American, the yeah. typical American, but I think when I first started going back to Bosnia, that's when it's, started drawing me in to try to preserve that culture or those memories that are now lost because of the people who died and as a result of being a part of that history. I definitely agree that there, there is a balance that you, you find at an early age that can be difficult. Um, we're, you know, we all go through personal growth, but I remember as a child, um, I would hear my name in Spanish and English, and I knew if it was in Spanish, I would be in trouble, but if it was in English, I'm okay, <laughs> you know, but there's things, um, you know, languages. Mm -hmm. I know um, in second grade, I learned English by watching Rugrats. I mean, you know, Rugrats, exactly. Yeah. You know, we, we think of these little things, but our families who um, came here for whatever reason, whatever circumstances, we also carry that with us. Mm -hmm. And we're aware of that as we're growing up and now. So how would you like uh, folks to talk about immigration uh, you, like I said before, we've heard from the adults at the table, not that the, all of you aren't young, <laughs> young adults, um, getting myself into a hole with the previous table there. <laughs> um, but is, is there a different way of looking at this topic that maybe we should be trying out that, that, the, that you don't always hear in regular conversations? Right, so I think it's easy that um, the, the context of it could be divisive in the media, but I mean, it's really about inclusion and coming together. Is and that I, easier when, and when she just said she uh, doesn't necessarily, people don't point her out when she <laughs> walks into the classroom? Yeah. I mean, that, that's yeah. an, an unfortunate truth, I'm, yeah. I'm guessing. I think that's, that's certainly true, um, the way you look or the way you yeah. appear. Um, if I decided to wear something that looks more from my cultural heritage, I, I might get a different look. I might be approached differently. Yeah. But I think um, I, I agree with Vin saying that immigration brings uh, many sides um, of the issue, especially yeah. politically. But I think more than anything, we can all agree on that, at least for me, immigration is important and education is essential mm -hmm. to talk about yeah. and to bring policies and, and to think about the classroom uh, where immigrants are and where they add in the city. Um, you know, I, I'm worried when I hear about um, legislation passing in Jeff City that could potentially harm or bar our immigrant students, like that is alarming and that shouldn't be happening. That is, that's giving the wrong message. We're confusing our families, we're confusing Missouri institutions. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the message we don't want to give to our immigrants, even the ones who have been here for so long. Um, so I think having this dialogue now and in the future and educating and sharing cultural differences uh. and embracing them is important to continue this conversation. I mean, really bringing a divorce, diverse mm -hmm. voice to the table and just continuing to have those conversations. Melting yeah. pot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's melt in a little uh, uh, conversation <laughs> from, from the Twitter sphere, shall we? Uh, find us at hashtag stay tuned STL. Uh, let's take a sampling of what you've already been saying tonight. Thanks. Thank you, guys.
So let's uh, let's bring everyone in on the conversation we've been having. Uh, we, we started off talking a lot about, uh, or a little bit about entrepreneurship. Let's continue that. Yeah. Betsy Cohen, Mosaic, uh, St. Louis Mosaic Project, executive director, back from the previous table. And Ibrahim Bajovic, uh, a businessman uh, in the Bosnian community. Uh, yeah. let, uh, maybe that's a perfect place to start, would be a little, uh, the history, if you would. G give, it, give us the story as you've seen it develop. Uh, over the last 20 years in, the, mm -hmm. in, the, in what a lot of us would say in the Bevo area, but it's expanded beyond that. Yeah, it has. Um, and you're correct, it has been almost 20 years since, a uh, little bit over 20 years since first the Bosnians came to St. Louis. And why we came to St. Louis, I think we already heard, but uh, in that time St. Louis had a very good job market, housing was very affordable, and we created the first small community. Once we found out that uh, we felt very good in this environment, we brought people from other parts of the United States of America and from Europe as well. Why? What did you like about St. Louis? It's so many things that I would like well, to I, say. I, was there something about that neighborhood in, in, in yeah, particular? It reminds us of our neighborhood back in, in Bosnia. And don't forget that neighborhood was built by Germans, by Irish people, Italian, and we're neighbors back in Europe. So it was architecturally very, very similar to our our environment back in Bosnia. So the community grew beyond what was originally here? Of course, of course, that was second uh, generation of immigrants or secondary immigration that uh, people came from other states of America and many of them came from Europe. And after that we brought our family members, so which was kind of uh, still a good program in, in the United States of America. Well, uh, the, the businesses, the, the buildings, speaking, going back to the buildings, uh, what was there before? What was, what were they, were they uh, thriving businesses or were they boarded up windows? Yeah, I remember in, in probably 1995 when I first time walked on Gravois and Morgan Ford and Kingside, South Kingside, eh? and it looked very strange, a building boarded up, uh, abandoned, not many, not businesses at all. And people st were moving out of that area. However, we found that area to be very, very good, convenient to us, and we started renting places first, and then we started purchasing small houses, and then we started doing businesses, opening businesses. However, today we have, I would say, close to 1,000 businesses in that area, South City. We're expanding to South County as well, and a little bit to Southwest County. So we have many, many businesses in that area, and that area looks very good. In fact, and I know you did, if you walk on Saturday or Sunday or Friday, you couldn't find a parking spot in that area. It's very crowded. Betsy, can we replicate this, or does it, ha does it only by sheer numbers that uh, something like this could happen, something uh, that, that we're not in control of, or can this be replicated? Well, you know, Anna mentioned also now we're only having maybe six to 700 refugees that come a year, and they're split from different ethnicities, whereas um, when our Bosnian neighbors came, they came by several thousands at a time. So they had a critical mass of community and knowledge and learning, and they, they built community and attracted it. So they had some advantages of scale that now we, we have to look more in a wider range of how do we build it. And I think some of the things that we're seeing, for example, with the uh, Cambridge Innovation Center and how you build serendipitous collisions, as they talk about, the entrepreneurial community, you build it by spaces and places and people, but not necessarily the fact that everyone's living near each other and starting neighborhood businesses by clusters, but it's more dispersed, but you come together when it's entrepreneurial. The, the Cambridge Center you're talking about, this is in the cortex, yes. in the central corridor, yes. in the central west end. So you bring people together for meetings and activities and ideas, but they don't all live together to start businesses, whereas with the Bosnian community, they live together and started businesses in that neighborhood. Brings back the academic component too. There, you talk, I, I would imagine when you when you think of Cortex and their efforts to harness the the graduates of the different universities. Yeah, particularly, and that's on high skilled. One of the things that the Mosaic Project is now working on is how do we also encourage neighborhood businesses, and we are looking at how do we create an ecosystem and bring people together. And Ibrahim is one of the people we're having our first immigrant entrepreneurship advisory board through the Mosaic Project, and a lot of it is going to be talking about neighborhood businesses. What do we do to help other clusters around the community do what they did, and how do our African immigrants here build community and start businesses? What resources do they need? What about our Latino? What about our Asian? Where are their clusters, or where are their separate places 
where they can start businesses. So we're bringing people together in March for the first time, and we're gonna do learning about how as a community we can help neighborhood businesses like we've also helped high-tech businesses. What are, you, what are you going to tell them when they, when they convene folks together? What, what, what are you going to tell them that the small business, the, uh, the small immigrant businessman or woman needs in St. Louis? He, star he started many businesses, so yeah. he's got a lot of ideas. Yeah, we do, and I think it's very, very simple. Uh, I would say that Bosnia has just uh, repeated some other patterns that we had from other communities, like Germans, people of Jewish faith, uh, Italians. So we just picked up on that pattern. However, we brought very good and hard, uh, hard working culture with us. We're hard working people and we value, value education as well. So for new immigrants, there's a lot of opportunities in St. Louis, that's why I would say. We have a great, great institution, International Institute, that helped many immigrants. We have Mosaic Project now, which is kind of step up from what we had a couple of years ago. And I think there are a lot of opportunities for small businesses. Uh, starting with good financing uh, to good uh, advisory advisors uh, from, from different areas. And then we have very good universities in St. Louis area. So I, I, I would say we have the whole, everything uh, uh, in, in St. Louis area that would help new immigrants start new businesses and grow. You mentioned the work ethic. Does that hold true in the younger generations that uh, don't know the history that they, they, they themselves were born here? Does that hold true? Uh, probably so, you know. I'm, I'm a first generation immigrant, as you could notice, I'm the only one with the accent tonight, <laughs> <laughs> which is okay. But second generation of immigrants, they have different views. But however, they still, they still keep a lot from, the, from us, from parents, and I think they're a good citizen and they're good, good people. Is that, is that a concern? Is that a, is that a priority of yours to, um, to, to retain that, that history, that, that community's memory of, of 20 years ago? Yeah, this is a, and my lesson. This is a lesson that I give to everyone. I would say just take everything that's good in this society from American culture and keep everything that's the best from your culture. Mm -hmm. If we put those things together, that would probably be the best uh, solution. And that's what most of our people do. I like it. Let's leave it on that note. Yeah. And well said. Uh, more from you at uh, hashtag stay tuned STL. how diverse St. Louis was. Mm -hmm. We see St. Louis mostly as black, white, but there are so many ethnic groups. I've been to so many festivals and dinners and celebrations that I didn't know existed because we've been so closed in. We're wrestling with this black, white thing, and it's, the city is going way beyond that. It's one day we're gonna wake up and find out we're more than black and white. We are a mosaic of many ethnic groups and cultures that make up this great city. Okay, uh, sticking with the theme of taking the best of each part and blending it together, we'll take the best of each group and continue this conversation here. Um, uh, Jorge, let me uh, start with you. Uh, you mentioned uh, Bob Fox, the founder of uh, Casa de Salud. Uh, he recently uh, wrote and said, uh, we need to double down on our efforts to attract a young, diverse workforce of new immigrants as well as continue to attract and retain the highly educated, a lot of what we've heard here tonight. But he also points out currently Hispanics make up a scant 2.5 percent of our population while other top 20 uh, size cities have over 20 percent. 2.5 for St. Louis versus 20 percent. Have we painted too rosy of a picture here tonight? I mean, are we, really, are we lagging behind in when it comes to our immigrant population. Well, we're lagging behind, but I don't think we're painting too rosy a picture. Uh, I mean, look, I got to St. Louis from Tampa, Florida, 22 years ago, and there is a palpable difference between what I experienced here 20 years ago and today. 
uh, the, the energy around immigrants, the energy around foreign born and diversity. Uh, it's off the charts compared to what it was when I got here from Tampa. So I can, I can self-experience that. And then I see what's happening at Casa de Salud. I see how many more people are arriving. Not enough, but there are more people who are coming in. And you've got all these people around the table and lots more, Bob Fox, among, one of, amongst many, who are really working very hard to make sure that it's not just a rosy picture, but that we're working to make it a real thing. Different, uh, Ibrahim, over 20 years, have you noticed a different atmosphere? Of course, of course. Uh, uh, when we came, it was cultural shock for all of us, and people needed some time to adapt to us, to our culture, and we needed time to adapt to American culture. Mm -hmm. However, it's not, it's nothing strange to have Bosnians in St. Louis now, in Missouri, in America. In fact, I had a class tonight at Webster University, and there were people from different healthcare organizations in, in St. Louis, and each of them had some employees that are Bosnians, and it's, they're proud of them, and I like to hear that. You know, there's kind of positive stereotype about Bosnians. However, I teach against stereotypes, but yeah, there's a positive <laughs> stereotype. They always say, oh, Bosnians, they're all good. Not all of us are good, but most people are. Most people are. Like but if I may add something about your question, uh, if we could do a better job, of course we could. And not just uh, bringing immigrants. I would say that we could do a lot better with uh, building a network with existing immigrants and our native countries. That would bring a lot more business opportunities to the United States of America. And that's how I see uh, uh, at our role now. Once we establish ourselves in, in St. Louis in America, once we have good businesses, we have good life, all of us would kind of like to do something for our country. And America, and for my example, Bosnia. So, and then we have people from Argentina, from Mexico, from uh, Brazil, from Turkey, and we need to know that those economies are growing faster than the United States of America. India, China. We need to use these immigrants as ambassadors, American ambassadors to do more businesses with those countries, you're especially nodding, growing. Countries. You're nodding your head a lot. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I very much agree that um, while we've, we've done a phenomenal job, but there is a gap that needs to be filled. Um, we can always do a better job. And I think that um, I love when you said that we want to invest. Immigrants want to invest back into this country, and I agree. And you know, circling back, I think of a branch of the population, of the immigrant population, of undocumented students and DACA students. There are policies at the state level that can bar these students from having the opportunity to potentially give back to the state, give back to St. Louis, to then go work at the International Institute and intern or go work and interpret at the Casa de Salud or go with um, the Mosaic Project, just as our friend Vin here, you know, he was born here and he had the opportunity. Um, but I think there is a, we're at this investment in our undocumented students who have been here for decades, most of their entire lives, but they can't go to school and they can't accomplish their dreams and they can't reach their potential. Um, because of certain policies. And so this is where I think um, legislators may um, don't know that they're sending that message. While we're here at this table discussing and providing resources and providing support for our immigrants, but there's a contradiction happening in Jeff City. Definitely. Well, it's an issue that we, we said it's not as uh, caustic as perhaps on the border, but it's, not, it's an issue that's not without controversy in our area. I mean, Valley Park in 2006, illegal immigration relief ordinance targeting anyone who employed or rented to illegal immigrants. Um, Berkeley has happened. Uh, Berkeley has a issue. housing, yeah. uh, some housing issues they're mm -hmm. dealing there with where the mayor was uh, standing by the, those, those, those laws, those ordinances. 2010 St. Charles County Council endorsed overwhelmingly a non-binding resolution endorsing Arizona's immigration law, uh, calling on Missouri legislators to do a similar, uh, a similar thing. So. It, but it's you know, not a one-sided issue, for it sure. It isn't, and, and part of it goes back to what we were discussing earlier, which is that, in fact, there are so few immigrants in St. Louis and in Missouri. And so people develop relationships with people when they know people who are different from them. And one of the challenges we've had here in Missouri, here in St. Louis, is that we actually have a very low rate of passport issuance um, in this area. People have not traveled and lived internationally. And if they don't then live around immigrants that are here, they don't understand and think of them as, as people with real issues. And it's when it's that person-to-person -person relationship that helps people really see beyond the stereotypes, the hype that they get in the news, et cetera. So 
the very fact that we want to attract more immigrants and we intend to do it will help in several ways. One is that it'll help build our economy because of entrepreneurism, more population, et cetera. But it will also help St. Louisans and Missourians be more global in terms of their thinking and, and, and their connections with the world, whether it be trade, but also be attitudinal. And we hope to see that then translate into more positive legislation about people that they suddenly know and care about. And I would say one thing that holds us back builds on one of the things that, that Ibrahim was saying, which has to do with a comment that people tell me, they're taking our jobs. Mm -hmm. And usually when we present, and maybe I present with him, he has many different businesses he's created. He was just discussing, he's hiring people who are all different ethnicities. Mm -hmm. And when you explain that people like Ibrahim are hiring people and bringing value mm -hmm. to all kinds of people, that really kind of puts aside that myth that people have. And they say, then they understand that this is truly an opportunity for everybody that we all benefit from. But you have to work through that myth that they are taking our jobs. And that's really the, the one that I get the most. Do you agree with uh, what Mr. Wright was just saying? I don't know if you heard the tape there, but from, from last week's show, African-American gentlemen saying that we are often too focused on, or, or, or too re focused on wrestling with our black and white issues here in St. Louis. And there's a lot that uh, maybe we're missing uh, when it comes to, to other folks in, in town. Yeah, I know, I, I agree. And I think that, again, a, a more racially diverse, a more ethnically diverse uh, St. Louis helps everybody. I think, I think ultimately it helps some of the strife that we're seeing now between black mm -hmm. and white because when you have a multiplicity of ways of seeing things, it can't, you, you are taken out of the same way of doing thing every time. And when you can get past that, you have other benefits. I'll stop you right there to say that we're going to pause the conversation and continue it on stay tuned stl.org. You can join us there on, online. We'll continue this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Say, say, say that again. We didn't, we didn't hear you online. Growing the pie is a big one. That There is a lot of concern. It goes back to what Betsy was just saying, in fact, about they're taking our jobs. Well, it's not about immigrants taking a job and therefore they're not being a job there anymore. But through entrepreneurism and actually through new population, what we do is we end up growing the pie. Um, you know, I'll hear people say, oh, well, they just started a Chinese restaurant and they hired other Chinese people, and, and that, that, that doesn't benefit us at all. Well, they buy the food at the local mar Walmart, they put gas in their car at the local gas station, they rent or buy a house. All of that is benefiting the wider economy. And so what they are doing is they are creating wealth for themselves and for the community through the business and through paying taxes. And they are also creating jobs for others as consumers out in the community. More people is a good thing, Doug, you think, in terms of we have a lot of in empty buildings. We have uh, schools that are closing because they- We certainly have plenty of room for that. I mean, the city was 850,000 people and it's 300 and 15,000 now. I think one of the things that we kind of need to step back and look at is what makes the region attractive, not just to immigrants, but to everybody. And I think that's the problem is that we haven't sold St. Louis. I hear people say St. Louis, I don't think much of St. Louis. Well, that's, that's not good. You know, we need people that are out there cheerleaders saying St. Louis is a great place and here is why. You know, the cost of living is cheap here. There's, there's an opportunity for professional development here. There are great educational institutions here. But I don't hear St. Louis being on the short list of places that people want to move or places that people want to go to vacation. You know, there's all of these things, I think there's a lot of instruments in place, but I don't think they're all sort of, if you want to use a music metaphor, I don't think they're all playing together, you know? They're all a little out of tune. Now, you're not suggesting there's fragmentation in the St. Louis I region. I am <laughs> suggesting that, yes, I am. Yeah. <laughs> Although I got to say, I, I feel like I'm obligated to bring this up because he said it on the show. Somebody mentioned Jim McKelvey, founder, mm -hmm. co-founder of Square, yep. uh, a, a ton of other things, uh, Launch Code. Yeah. Uh, he's he's tired of us saying that we have a low cost of living. I don't know if that sparks mm -hmm. anything on this conversation. Well, yeah, we're paying you know, Arch Grants. You know, they offer money for people to come and start businesses because we believe that when they start businesses, it's good for the region, and we hire more people. It's the same thing with immigrants, you know, that we need them to come and we need them to understand that this is going to be a great place for them to be. And I think that's why the success stories that we can share of people who do move here and they're successful, those stories will breed more success. 
One caveat, though, we don't pay the immigrants to come. Correct. That's another myth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they come under their own, well, with their own two feet or under their own steam. At, at their own point. risk. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, one of the big uh, uh, you know, questions I get in terms of myths are, well, how come immigrants start so many businesses? And uh, the response you know, I'll get is, well, they get free you know, loans at that point. They get no interest loans. They get this and that. They do not, absolutely not. Sure. They compete on the same level with anybody else in the community. Um, if they come to the micro lending program, for instance, that we have at the International Institute, um, they may be under collateralized or not have a credit history and come for a loan there. They're going to pay 4.5% higher than they would if they go to the bank for the money, but they have a good business plan at that point and they were willing to put in the sweat equity to make it work. That's very different from getting some kind of a handout. And uh, immigrants are, are not used to getting handouts. That's not the way that they have operated in their own country, and it's not the way they operate here. I'm guessing you have a passport. Yes. I, th I found that fascinating. Yeah. Vin, passport, I'm yes. sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your friends have passports? And, and, and how, much, how much of your life um, this is one of those questions I start to ask, and I'm like, wait, is this in inappropriate? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a friendly room. Okay. It has been spent at the customs office? Is that no, it? that's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Go. I'm just curious, you know, how much of your circle of friends uh, are, are, are Bosnian, are, uh, uh, have a similar cultural background of, as you, and how, or, or is that? I think as I've grown, my involvement with the Bosnia Memory Project it has grown more. But growing, growing up, not so up, much. Not so much because we moved to West County yeah. very early. And I, well, again, with the teenage angst, I wanted to suppress everything that had to do with Bosnia. But now that I'm maturing and <laughs> as a millennial in this country, um, I'm growing my Bosnian pod, if you will. Yeah. And for me, growing up in the St. Louis Public Schools, I mean, my best friend is for his mom immigrated from Romania, another good friend of mine, his family immigrated here from Ethiopia. I mean, it, it really is the mosaic of St. Louis, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. in growing up in the St. Louis public schools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's good. Thank you, guys. Thank I you. appreciate all your time and all your insights. Yeah. It was very good. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank nice job. Thanks for sticking with us online. That's it for tonight.